Welcome to Fairview Baptist Church in Lindsay. Not only do we want to minister to the people who regularly attend Fairview, but we also want to minister to those who live within the city of Kortha Lakes with the good news of Jesus Christ. Come on in and, and join us for worship. It is our prayer that you'll be blessed. because uh, usually I love it because it's so much cooler here than it is down south. Not so much this time, but uh, it seems like it never fails that I get more invitations to come here in the horrible apocalyptic month of January. Do what? Oh, I'm sorry. He's reminding me that I need to dismiss the children because uh, there's a fear that I would bore them literally to death. And so if you are a child and you would like to escape total boredom, you are dismissed to go have way more fun than we're about to have here today. So I was told that they know where they're going, and look, right on cue, they know exactly what they're doing. It's fantastic. All right, you're not missing anything. Uh, we're going to basically read the Old Testament Leviticus in Hebrew uh, and then spend 30 minutes in silent prayer. There'd be no cookies or juice. It's not going to be fun at all. But it's good to be here. I usually get invitations. Most of my invitations to come to Canada happen in the horrible month of January. Uh, I just want to remind you that there's a lot of land south of here uh, that's wide open, and you're welcome to come. I don't know why you would live here in January. It's really, really horrific. But you're hearty, wonderful people. And uh, maybe that's why you're such sweet people. Something happens in hardship, right? Because the Bible says that perseverance produces character. And you guys have amazing character. You're just so kind. I've never heard the word sorry more in my life <laughs> than when I come to Canada. Like, you don't need to be sorry. You don't really. You don't. It's okay. It's my, no, it's my fault. I'm sure it's, no, it's my fault. No, it's my fault. No, it's my fault. Uh, so and it's always good to be with you guys. Thanks. And you're amazing singers. Fantastic singers, really great. Usually men don't sing. So way to go, men. Yes, way to stand up. You actually sang. That's fantastic. Well, if you have your Bible, you can turn to Exodus chapter 16, and that's where we'll be at the beginning of the service. And we're going to make our way from there to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So if you want to just put a thumb at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, you can. But we're going to begin in Exodus 16 after I move the worship leaders' mess. Worship leaders are messy. Let me just make a mess of the stage. i got to tiptoe around it all. And so that's where we're going to be. Now, I want to start with a very foundational theological premise. All right? This is where we'll begin. I believe with all my heart that God is Southern. Uh, <laughs> I can prove this. In Exodus chapter 16, it says that God's children were making this long journey from slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land. And on this long road trip, God's children became a little hungry and a lot whiny. And so God pulled over the minivan and he had a talk with his kids through the babysitter Moses. And he said through his babysitter Moses, I'm not used to operating my own clicker here, so let's see if I've got it here. He says, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. And the people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them, and I will see whether they will follow my instructions. Take only your daily bread. This is a test to see if you'll obey my instructions. Now, God, being a good father that he is, he kept his promise. That's what good dads do. And so the next morning when his children woke up, they looked out on their front yards, and they saw their millions of delicious, sweet, flaky pieces of bread, so good they'd never tasted anything like it, and they named it manna, which in Hebrew means, what is this? That's what it means. And in the evening, God rained down quail from heaven. So what is it? Now, manna in the morning and quail in the evening, or where I come from, we would call that biscuits and chicken. Obviously, God is Southern. You're not going with me on that? Okay, can we at least, can we at least all agree, can we at least all agree that God is good? Amen? Amen? And he gives us his best, but the problem with getting God's best is that it often brings out the worst in us. And so, as God delivered breakfast and he delivered dinner, he also delivered law. See, God had a special plan for his people. 
He was moving them from slavery to one day become a new kind of nation the world had never seen. He is moving them to a cul-de-sac he picked out just for them in the land of Canaan. And in this cul-de-sac that he's moving them to, they will be completely surrounded by neighboring nations that don't know God. Now, right now, his children are grumbly, self-centered, whiny little brats. But over the next 40 years, he's going to grow and mature and reform and change them into a nation that will work in such a way that the whole neighborhood will look at them and see what God is like. They will look at them and they will see that God is good and that God can be trusted. To, to make them that kind of people, <laughs> to turn brats into disciples, he begins to give them laws along this journey. And the first laws he gives them are not the Ten Commandments. But the very first law he gives is about breakfast. Take only your daily bread, Exodus 16, 4 says. Take only your daily bread. Do you want to be a people that show the world God is good and can be trusted? Start here with the first law. Take only your daily bread. Do you want to be a church that shows this community that God is good and he can be trusted? Take only your daily bread. You want to be a person who shows the neighborhood that God is good and can be trusted? Then take only your daily bread and then pass the biscuits. So everyone else gets to taste and see God is good and trust him. Now, God told them exactly how much daily bread was. He told them it was one omer or uh, about two and a half liters of bread. That's daily bread. You get one omer for every person who lives in your tent. And for a while, they obeyed this law. No problem. They took one omer for everyone in their household until one day someone broke the law. Now, the Bible doesn't give us enough detail here. You know, it doesn't tell me everything I want to know. And I wish at times like this that the Holy Spirit would have inspired my wife to write Exodus because we would know who broke that law, what day it was, what they were wearing, and how everybody felt about it. We would have all the detail that I would ever want, but we don't have that detail. All we know is someone broke it. But I, but I wonder, forgive me, I'm going to use my imagination a little bit. I, I just wonder, why would they do that? Maybe someone was an early riser, one of those hard workers, you know, an accountant, maybe, something like that. And, and they got up before everyone else, you know, like a 4.30 a.m. wake-up call. And they, and they bounded out their tent, ready to take on the day, and they collected their one omer for everyone in their house. They had all their daily bread, but they were so on top of it, they were so diligent and hardworking that they beat everybody else to the breakfast buffet. And maybe they looked around and they thought, well, those lazy people, I worked hard. I worked harder than all of them. I, I deserve more. And maybe they took a little extra. Or maybe, maybe it was someone who, after they collected everything for their family, maybe they looked out across the field and they saw there were still millions of pieces of delicious what is it's left. And, well, who's going to miss a little? There's plenty. We don't know their motivation or their reasoning, but we know that somebody took more than their daily bread. Someone took leftovers and put it away in the pockets of their toga, and they walked back in their tent, and they stored it in their retirement, I'm sorry, in their refrigerator in case God ever stopped being good, in case God ever stopped being someone they could trust for daily bread. And the Bible says that God became angry. And he turned their maggots into stink. And it no longer satisfied. I know a little something about that. Maybe you do too. We can fill up our shopping carts. We can fill up our phones with apps. We can fill up our homes with the best and latest decor. We can fill up our closets with the latest fashions, we can fill up our walls with diplomas, we can fill up our resumes with accomplishments, but we're never quite filled up. Because God has made us in such a way that the only thing that will ever satisfy us is trusting a God that we really believe is good and trustworthy. And anything else will just turn to maggots and stink. It will never satisfy. 
It says in the Bible in Exodus 16 that after God turned their excess to, to maggots and stink, that they began taking their daily bread again. I mean, who wouldn't you? I mean, if I come to breakfast tomorrow morning and I pull that healthy cereal that, I, that my wife buys for me, you know, the, the, it's made out of tree barks and berries, right? And, and if I go to pour that into my bowl, but instead of pouring, it kind of slithers. And when it hits the bowl, it doesn't smell like tree bark or berries. I'm going to be on my face right there beside the kitchen table crying out to God, Oh, God, forgive me. You've turned the contents of my refrigerator and my pantry to maggots and stink. What have I done? I am so sorry. And God, being a good father, he gives second chances. Amen? And it says that from that time on, they obeyed the first law. They took only their daily bread, and it ends so beautifully. It says that the one who gathered much because he had much family didn't have too much. And the one who gathered little because he had a little family didn't have too little. But everyone had as much as they needed. But this is the best part. Everyone got to taste and see that God really is good and God really can be trusted. Now, it's a dangerous thing to take one little law from the Old Testament and, well, and apply it to our lives here in modernity, isn't it? I mean, there are all kinds of laws in the Old Testament you and I don't live by, so why should we take this law about breakfast any more seriously? There's a law in the Old Testament that says that you're not supposed to shave, so with the exception of me and one other man in the room who loves Jesus, uh, you know, the rest of you are all lawbreakers. And there's a law that says that you can't mix the fibers of your clothing. It's right there in Leviticus, right after the shaving law. It says that everything on your body has to be made out of the same stuff. So if your pants are made out of cotton, everything else on your body, I mean, the things that we can't see and none of us really want to see, it's all got to be made out of cotton or else you're a lawbreaker. Why aren't you taking that law more seriously? There's a law that says every month I'm supposed to put my wife in a tent in the backyard for about a week. It's right there in Leviticus, and she's <laughs> begged me to do it, and I have not yet done it. But there are all kinds of laws given to the Jews in the wilderness that we don't live by today because we're not Jews living in the wilderness. Now, why should this law about bread and breakfast be any different, right? Well, not so fast. You see, there are other laws given to the Jews in the wilderness that you are living by this morning. Like for instance, thou shalt not lie. Shouldn't have any other gods before me. You should keep the Sabbath day holy. I mean, if you don't care about laws given to Jews in the wilderness, why on earth are you here this Sunday? What about that law? It says that you should love your one and only and only that one and only. And when you stood before that crowd of witnesses and You took her hand, you took his hand, and you pledged, I do, until death do us part. Why would you do that? You only did that because the law was given to Jews in the wilderness. Why are you living by that? So how do we decide? How do we decide which laws of theirs become laws of ours? Well, one way is to read the New Testament and to look for Gentiles. That's non-Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians who are living by Old Testament Jewish laws. If you can find a Gentile Christian living by an Old Testament Jewish law in the New Testament, well, you got to at least pause and say, hey, maybe I'm not off the hook either. So let's do that. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 10. Galatians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is sent out as the very first missionary to Gentiles. Not to Jews. He's being sent only to the Gentiles. The very first messenger of his kind. And he's being sent to them to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Crucified, buried, and resurrected for the forgiveness of sins. And he's there in the church in Jerusalem on a Sunday morning. And they lay hands on him, the pillars of the church, James, Peter, and John. And they pray for him as he begins his missionary journey. And they give him one piece of instruction as he heads out those doors. They said to him in Galatians chapter 2, verse 10, All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, which is the very thing I had been eager to do all along. That word eager means a fervent desire, a desire so strong that it cannot be stopped. Do you have a fervent desire that cannot be stopped to care for the poor. Who were the poor? Well, we see where this eagerness comes from when we understand who the poor were that he was talking about. We believe now that about 80% of the Christians living in Jerusalem in the first century 
We're living in poverty. The Bible defines physical poverty as not having daily bread. The Bible defines middle class, though it doesn't use that word, as having daily bread. And the wealthy in Scripture are those who have more than daily bread. You've got bread for today and for tomorrow. You're rich. So the poor in this verse are the 80% of the Christians in the church that day who didn't have food to eat every day. So Paul looked out across the sanctuary that day, and he would have seen fathers with tears still wet on their cheeks from burying little ones too soon. He would have seen listless toddlers, stoic, starving. Malnourished infants sitting on the laps of mothers whose breasts were depleted of milk. And what they were saying to him was, Paul, as you go and you preach the gospel, don't forget about us. And because Paul knew the poor, because he had looked into their eyes, because he knew their names, because he had a relationship with them, he was eager to care about them. You couldn't stop him from caring. I'll be honest, for most of my life, poverty, the poor, was something politicians talked about. Maybe economists gave statistics about. Maybe a pastor might mention. But I didn't know any. It was an idea, it wasn't a person. That all changed for me and I became eager. I was in Ethiopia and I got a flat tire. It takes a long time for a musician to change a flat tire. So I had time to make a friend. This little girl came wandering out of the bushes. I don't see very far without these glasses, maybe about 10 feet and then it falls off into a haze. So I couldn't see who was coming toward me. I just knew they were small. And I raised my camera just to zoom in and get a better look. And when she saw me raise my lens, she raised two fingers to her mouth to say to me the only way she could, please feed me. And I motioned her toward me and she shuffled toward me. And I took in the details as she became clearer. Her skin was not the beautiful brown God meant it to be, but it was an ashy gray. Her eyes were runny, her nose was crusty. Her hair was rusting around the edges, a symptom of malnutrition. She came even closer. I noticed that dress she was wearing was someone else's shirt, far too big for her. She was missing toenails. She came even closer and I tried to make her laugh. I love kids. And I just couldn't get her to crack a smile. It's like she was there, but she wasn't there just barely alive, shuffling toward me. I put my hand on the back of her head to pray for her, and I felt huge slick spots where starvation had robbed this little one of her hair. I pulled her toward me and held her tightly as I prayed for her, and I felt her skeleton press into my, my squishy middle. And I just begged God, would you please give this little one food? Would you please give her mom and her dad work? Would you please keep her safe as she's out here wandering around looking for any kind of help she can get? God, will you please save her? The thing I'll never forget is her tongue. Swollen and bright red. Huge, so big she couldn't close her mouth around it. Even if we spoke the language, she couldn't have spoken to me. And I've never forgotten her. I never forgot walking her to the nearest church I could find, taking her to the pastor and saying, I don't know where she comes from, and I don't know her name, and I don't speak her language, and I don't think she speaks, but can you please take care of this one? And he promised that he would, but I don't know what happened. As I drove away, I could still see her in my rearview mirror, and every time I close my eyes, I can conjure her image as if she's right here in front of us this morning. It is not hard for me to remember the poor because they're not a number. They're not a theology. They're not a plank in a political platform for me. It's a person. 
And if you're not eager to care for the poor, if this morning is a chore that you have to sit through, if you're just hoping I will finally shut up and you can go to lunch, if there's no eagerness, no passion, no fire in you to have compassion on the poor, then I wonder, brothers and sisters, could it be because you don't know any? Because you've asked your politicians to care for them so you can keep a safe distance. You've asked your missionaries to care for them so you can be safely miles away. I dare you, I challenge you, I beg you, get out of your neighborhood and look into the eyes of someone who does not live the kind of life you do, not to pity them, but to get to know them, to learn to love them, to hear their story. So they're not just a number anymore to you. That's where eagerness comes from. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. All of that gives us the context to understand this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The apostle Paul made good on his promise to remember the poor. And he went out into the world as he had been called. And he preached the good news of Christ. And when he did, tens of thousands of people responded and came to faith in Christ. And they gathered together in churches in places like Galatia and Corinth and Antioch and all these places across the empire. And when these churches, these bodies of believers reached a state of maturity, then the apostle Paul would give them the gift of being able to give. This is how Paul remembered the poor in Jerusalem. He asked the mature believers in the rest of the empire to pass their biscuits. He first would write them a letter telling them about the need among their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. They don't fly your flag. They don't have your color of skin. They don't have your shape of a nose. But they're your brothers and sisters because you call the same God Father. And then he would ask them to create leftovers. Now, for some people, that meant selling lands or houses. For some other people, it may have meant, and we know this is a fact that many did this, may, may have meant that they fasted one day a week. We know that the early church did this. For at least the first 300 years of Christianity, it was standard practice to fast one day a week and then to take the leftovers created by that and give it to the poor. The earliest church bulletin, the or, or earliest order of service we have from a Christian church was written by Justin Martyr in 156 AD. And it describes a church service. He was writing to Caesar because Caesar thought that we were cannibals. You know, when you say we get together because, and we have the Lord's Supper because Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood, that's a little scary to Romans. And so he wrote a letter saying, no, 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 we're not diabolical. Here's what we do when we get together. And he said, there's only three things that every Christian church does. No matter where they are in the world, there's three things every Christian church does when they get together. It's not singing. It's not preaching. He said, we always take communion. Because no matter how divided we are, that sacrifice of Jesus unifies it. We all need Jesus. And the second thing we do is we pray for each other. We pray for each other. We bear each other's burdens. And the third thing that we always do when we get together is we take a collection for the poor and it's immediately distributed to the poor. And so Paul would write a letter to the churches and he would say, that's what I want you to do. When you get together, I want you to create leftovers in your life. And then I want you, I'm going to come visit you and I'm going to take up an offering and I want you to give to that offering and I'll carry your offering back to the church in Jerusalem so that through the church in Jerusalem, the needs of the community will be met. So that's the model, that mature Christians pass their biscuits to the church so that through the church, the needs of the community can be met and everyone can taste and see how good God is. So this is one of those letters. This is just one of those letters in Paul's epistles. And I just want to look at three verses of this letter and talk about each one because they tell us something very, they tell us some very important truths about giving. Second Corinthians chapter eight, he's speaking about the offering he's coming to collect and he says, let me just clarify for you, our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. 
You know, theologians believe that Paul is, is saying one of two things or maybe both. That word hard-pressed is translated from a Greek word, philipsis. Philipsis in your New Testament is usually translated as the English word tribulation. So he's saying I, our desire isn't that this offering that you're giving would be a tribulation to you. And so we believe that, that, that there are at least two things Paul's saying here. One is about attitude. Your attitude toward giving should be one of eagerness and joy. It shouldn't be a burden. It shouldn't be a burden. If the Jesus Christ, who eagerly came to earth, made himself poor for us, suffered ridicule and shame and dishonor and death on a criminal's cross for you, the Jesus who looked out on the crowds and had compassion, the Jesus who spared no expense to love, if that Jesus lives in you, then generosity should not be a burden. It should be a joy because that was a joy for Jesus and now he lives through you. Which begs the question, if giving isn't a joy for you, well, what are you possessed by? It might not be Jesus. The second point he may be making is, in addition to our attitude about giving, he may be saying something about the amount of our giving. Now, in my country, and you guys are so sweet, I'm sure that you don't have this problem, but in my country, money and giving is almost never talked about. I mean, there is no quicker way to run your church off than to talk about giving, right? And so when a pastor in my country even speaks about giving or service or money, the goal is to get people who have said, all to Jesus I surrender, to just give something. Because in my country, the average American, according to the 2013 IRS numbers, the average American Christian, that's someone who goes to church, uh, a regular attender is someone who goes to church just once a month. The average regular attending Christian in the U.S. gives 2.14% of their disposable income away. So they take their check and then they buy their house and their insurance and their car and all of that stuff. And then out of what's left, they give 2.14% of that away. Now the Old Testament, the government and the church were one thing. It was a theocracy. You don't live in a theocracy and neither do I, but under the theocracy, the tax was 10%. When we get to the New Testament, 10% is never mentioned. You are never instructed in the New Testament to give 10%. My wife's an accountant. She's an auditor. She loves numbers. Like, just give me a percentage and we'll give it. So I so, said, well, if I have to give you a percentage, then I'd have to go with 50. Because Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. She didn't really like that. So there's no percentage really in the New Testament. That means that we're free to give as much as we're compelled to give. And in my country, that's very little. I'm sure you don't have that problem. So our goal in the U.S. is to try to get people to just give something. That's most people. In a typical church, about 80% of the people do nothing. 20% of the people do 80% of the work and the giving. So get people who don't give anything to give something. And to give those who give something to just give a little bit more. And to get them to do that joyfully. I mean, it's an impossible task. Paul had a different problem. Instead of trying to get people to give a minimum... He sets a maximum. Have you ever heard that sermon before? See, Paul says how, to the people who are wondering, how much should I give, Paul? He says, just give until you're hard-pressed. I don't want you to go homeless so someone else can have a roof. I don't want your children to starve so someone else can have breakfast. So you get to give as much as God compels you to give, as much as you can give joyfully, but just don't give too much. Wouldn't you love to hear that sermon? We're about to pass the offering plates, and Sister Smith, uh, I just, I, I love your joy. 
I know how much God has done in your life. We know who you used to be and who God made you, and he saved you and you used to be his enemy, but now you're his daughter. And I love to see the joy on your face. And I know when we pass these offering plates, you're going to be tempted to, draw, to drop the, the contract on your house and that offering plate. But listen, 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 Sister Smith, hold back. Dial it down a notch. I don't want you to be hard-pressed. Wouldn't that be a church I'd love to be a part of? Okay, it's getting uncomfortable. Next verse. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 14. He says, at the present time, your plenty, more accurately, your surplus, your leftover biscuits, will supply what they need so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Our God is so good that he has made sure that while there are people on earth who don't have enough, you know, they get to experience God's provision. They get real tangible proof that God sees them, he loves them, he cares for them, and he's meeting their needs. But at the same time, he makes sure their people have more than enough, and those people get to experience being part of God's provision for someone else. And there's no greater joy or satisfaction than to be able to let go of what you don't need and give it to someone else and still be okay. That's a gift. God has made sure that there are always those who have more than enough and always those who don't have enough. And here's the kicker. We don't get to decide which one we are. I didn't choose to be born in America. I didn't choose to be born to a family with a mom and a dad who loved me and cared about me and fed me and read me books, made sure I was doing good in school. I didn't choose to grow up in a country where school was free, where clean water came out of the tap. I didn't choose any of that. And I have some talent and I have some skill and I, you know, you could go, well, yeah, but you know, you've got, you should be proud of yourself. You worked hard, you practice hours and hours for years and you will, I guess, but you know, God gave me hands. <laughs> he gave me a brain. I, I'm doing what I can with what I've got, but everything I've got was given. Everything I have is manna from heaven. And same goes for you. But here's the scary thing. Because it's all a gift. It doesn't have to be given. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know where I'll be someday. I don't know what my kids, you know, just two generations ago, my, parent, my grandparents were living in the Great Depression, eating dirt and grass just to get by. We're not in control of history, and we're not in as much control of our prosperity as we believe that we are. And Paul is humbling these dear believers and saying, look, at the moment, <laughs> through no real effort of your own, you've got more than enough. And you get to share with those who don't have enough and just a warning, someday the roles might be reversed. You really don't know. Next verse. The goal, he says, of this giving is equality. As it is written, this is important. We're in a, you may have heard we're having a bit of election in my country. <laughs> yeah. Did you guys... You guys heard a thing or two about that, maybe? <laughs> Whew. And so uh, I've never gotten more hate mail in my life than I have over the last six months. So your election is over in like, I don't know, two weeks. I don't know. It's like really quick. Ours goes for, it feels like five years, right? And American Christians get a little too wrapped up in who is sitting in the Oval Office. And so, by just quoting a scripture and making no comment, like just using the word equality, I promise you, my inbox gets full of hate. Because that word equality, where I come from, is very much attached to politics. Is that how it is here? You hear the word equality and you think one side of the aisle or the other, maybe? Okay, no. Some of you are saying yes, some of you are saying no. Some of you are telling the truth, some of you are in denial, right? <laughs> Where I come from, that word equality is usually a political word. It's not a Bible word. It's definitely not a church word. I'm so thankful, though, that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul not just to use the word equality, but to define it. So politicians can't. But we, as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, 
we have to go by this definition. And he says, the goal is equality. What does that mean? Well, the kind that was written about in Exodus 16. The one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. But everyone had as much as they needed. The one small little paragraph of three verses, the Apostle Paul takes an antiquated law given to Jews in the wilderness, and he places it solidly on the other side of Calvary in front of you and me and says, this law stands. Take only your daily bread and pass the biscuits because there's a whole world out there that hasn't tasted the goodness of God and they haven't trusted him yet. Let me tell you a story that proves this works. I was in the Mathari slum in Nairobi, Kenya, second largest slum in all of Africa, 80,000 people crammed into two square miles of rusting corrugated metal. It was raining that day as my friend and I, we sloshed our way through the serpentine paths of the slum until we finally arrived at Elliot's house. Elliot, 18 years old, dapper Kenyan young man wearing his seafoam green tie and his gray sweater, standing in front of a house smaller than your bathroom. Six by eight. 48 square feet. But he had a smile on his face because even though his house is little, he knows that God is big. He told us his story. When he was five years old, that's not in the right place. I'm sorry. I'll just keep it on that. When he was five years old, his mother passed away, leaving his father to care for him all by himself. Now, Elliot's father works as a day laborer. Day laborer is the most common occupation on the planet. Out of 7 billion people on earth right now, roughly 2 billion of them work as day laborers. Day laborers go out every day and they take any job they can for any wage that's offered. There is no ability to negotiate a better wage. And if at the end of a hard day's work you aren't paid, there is no legal recourse. There are no benefits packages. There's no pension plan or retirement at the other side. But out of desperation, they work every day for anyone they can for any wage. And working his hardest, Elliot's father couldn't earn just $2 a day. It's not enough money to put food on the table. So Elliot's father began to starve himself, skip meal after meal, just so his boy could have something in his belly. And it wasn't much. A little rice, a few beans, a plantain once a day. He said there was a special occasion, he can remember, of a particularly incredible day when he, his dad surprised him. He couldn't remember if it was Christmas or if it was a birthday, but his dad came through those doors at the end of a hard day's work with a piece of meat they got to share. Now, a little one who doesn't get proper nutrition, their immune system wears out, it wears thin, and Elliot's did. He was constantly battling sickness, and there was no money to go see a doctor. So he would just hope and wait now imagine if you were in that situation here in Canada. If you were born into what we call poverty, you could still escape because of school. Your government provides free school. Now, I can't convince my four kids that school is a gift from God, but it really is. It's a powerful gift. So stay in school, kids. Uh, and set your sights higher than being a musician. You can do better, all right? But if you work hard enough in school for free, then in about, I don't know, what is it, like 50 years, you finally get a diploma, right? It's this magical piece of paper that opens up a world of options and possibilities for you, and you can almost certainly give your children a better life than the one you were born into. But that's not how it works in most of the world. Elliot could go to a Kenyan public school, but he'd have to pay for it like private school here. He'd have to buy the books and the backpack and the uniform and the shoes and the meal. And on top of that, he'd have to pay fees to pay the salaries of the teachers. So how can a father who can't afford to put bread on a plate afford to put books in a bag? It's a hopeless situation that millions find themselves in. But for Elliot, at the end of his rope with no other options, with no way out, just the right time, a knock came on the door. 
And standing at the door that day was a pastor from a church right there inside the slum. And that pastor, Elliot said, talked like a crazy man. He made promises that just couldn't be true. <laughs> he told Elliot that he would not go to bed hungry anymore. He told him that if he ever got sick with a toothache, a stomachache, something truly life-threatening, that there would be doctors and dentists and nurses and counselors to put him back together again. He told him that he could go to school and the backpack and the shoes and the, all of it, it would all be taken care of. And if he worked very hard and if he was very smart, he could even go on to university. If he wasn't that smart and if he wasn't that hardworking, you know, maybe he's a musician. He said, it's okay. While you're working on that high school diploma, we're also going to teach you a trade. We're going to teach you how to, how to work computers or, or how to fix things with your hands or how to build things out of steel. But we're going to teach you a job so that when you graduate, you'll graduate into a job and give your children a better life than the one you had. Poverty is going to end with you, he promised. But that's not even the best promise he made. The best promise was when he looked Elliot in the eyes and he said, God sees you. God loves you. God has a plan for your life. And that was the day everything changed. Because that was the day that Elliot became one of Compassion's children. Compassion International invented child sponsorship in 1952. And to this day, they're still the highest rated child sponsorship organization of their kind in the world. In fact, they're in the top 1% of all charities worldwide. And they work in a beautiful, and now you know, very biblical way. Because Compassion... We believe that the most powerful thing on earth is not a government. Canadians, you need to hear me on this. The most powerful thing on earth is not a government, and it's not a corporation, but the most powerful thing on earth is the body of Jesus Christ, the local church. And so always and only through the local church around the world in 26 countries, Compassion International meets the physical and spiritual needs of children, little ones born into families that earn less than $2 a day. Every child cared for by a church, and every child receives five things, education, health care, proper nutrition, clean water to drink, and most importantly, a Bible and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because compassion serves the poor through the church of Christ, demonstrates the love of Christ, and preaches the good news of Christ, on average, 500 children every single day come to faith in Christ through the Ministry of Compassion International, over 158,000 last year alone. And that's not counting moms and dads and aunts and uncles and neighbors and friends that they then lead to Christ. Whole neighborhoods are transformed, whole communities, and eventually entire nations. I was in Uganda just two years ago, and I met the first woman elected into the parliament of Uganda, and she was a formerly sponsored compassion child. This is how the world has changed. Not from the top down, but from the church out. And it happens in the same way that it happened in Paul's day. Every child needs a sponsor. Someone who will pass their biscuits. Someone who will give $41 a month. And that $41 enables a church to meet one child's needs. $41 a month. That's not a lot of biscuits for most of us. I don't know about here, but in America, the average American spends over $100 a month on soft drinks. You guys probably do that at Tim Hortons, but <laughs> we spend almost $200 a month on cable or satellite television. The average age that a kid gets a smartphone now is 10. I just think there are a lot of ways that we could create a little bit of leftovers and pass it to a child through a church. The best sponsors don't, don't, don't just give their money. That's easy. The best sponsors give themselves. I asked Elliot his sponsor's name, and he said, my sponsor's name is Nick Erskine, Northern California. I didn't have the heart to tell him that Northern California is not part of the guy's name. I just played along. I just said, well, does Nick Erskine, Northern California, ever write you letters? Every child, you know, every, every sponsor can, and they should, but sometimes they forget. And he got very excited, and he pulled from a hiding place where he keeps them safe and dry. This stack of letters. A stack of letters from Nick Erskine, Northern California, that had started arriving at his house when he was seven, and they're still showing up when he was 18. And he reads those letters every day, he says, because life's hard. 
And he needs to remember what's true about himself. And so he reads the words from Nick Erskine, Northern California. I read them. I love you so very much, he said. I am praying for you today. I am so proud of the man that you're becoming. Don't you quit. I believe God has a big plan for your life. And he keeps going. I wanted so badly that day for Nick Erskine, Northern California, to be with me in Elliot's house. You know, because the best of us are skeptical. And I wanted him to see with his own eyes what I got to see. That the $41 he gives to Compassion, it goes where they say it's going to go, and it's done everything they said it would do. I wanted to see the letters he wrote. They arrived, and they were treasured and powerful in his life. But I couldn't afford a plane ticket to bring Nick all the way to Elliot. So I brought Elliot to Nick. And I may need some help in the back getting this video to work. You guys watch this. Can you, can you fire it up for me? Okay. May I ask you a question? Yes. Can I do it directly? Yes, you may talk directly to like him. No, I'm talking to you and Nick. You may, yeah. you may talk directly to Nick. Okay. Dear Nick, how are you? I hope you are fine. Um, it's fine. It's a blessing to have you. And I can imagine how good you are to me. I love you very much. And you, are, you, are, you mean a whole thing to me. You are like my dad. You are like my mom. Give me hope and strength to be who I am. Thank you for all the things you've been doing for me and for the ones you continue doing. I pray to God to bless you, to give you hope, to encourage you, to also support others who are in need. As we exited Elliot's house, um, I looked up above the door and I saw some writing, some green handwriting. And I watched as Elliot placed his hand beside those words, and bowed his head, just silently prayed them before exiting into the darkness of the slum. God loves me. How does he know that? enough to feed me, bless me, and give me hope for the future. Amen. God loves you. Enough to bless you with more than enough to bless someone else. To give someone else bread so they will know they are loved by God. To allow someone else to taste God's goodness and to trust Him. Do you want to be the kind of person shows the world what God is like, start here. Take your daily bread. Open your hand on everything else and just simply ask God this morning, where do you want me to pass it? Can I make a couple of suggestions where you might be able to pass your extra time, talent, energy, and resources? Start here. If this church is typical, 80% of you give nothing. No time, no energy, and no money. In my family, my four kids all have responsibilities. And if they don't do their responsibilities, well, we don't have clean dishes to eat off of. We don't have a mowed yard to walk through. Life falls apart if everyone in a family doesn't do their job. Start today treating this like a family because it is and give here first. If you've never put money in the offering plate, that ends today. If you've never volunteered your time, that can end today. I know that you need people to help in children's ministry. I've never been to a church that says, wow, we have a waiting list of people who are eager to teach two-year-olds. It's never happened. And I know that you need people to mentor youth. I am who I am today 
because two Sunday school teachers forever changed the direction of my life. You could be used by God to do that. Beyond this church building, what's happening in your city and in your neighborhood? Do you know the people who live in the houses around you or do you only know what kind of car parks there? Get to know your neighbors and then serve them with your time, your smiles, your provision, and maybe even your wealth. And then after you do that, if you still have more leftovers, wow, you're blessed. And you get the gift of giving to those in other parts of the world. And so this morning, you could sponsor a child through compassion. On the table out there in the lobby, there are a zillion of these. That's an approximate number, approximately a zillion of these Compassion Child Sponsorship Packets. Every packet has the picture of a real child, their name, their birthday, uh, and a bit of their story inside. Each of my four kids sponsors a child. We find it's a great way to teach our kids about compassion, about missions, about saving in order to give to others, and just general perspective. And so I sponsor a child for each of my children, and when they're old enough, they pay that until they are. It goes on my credit card, but they are responsible to write those letters every month and to pray for that child every night, and they love it. So perhaps you could pick up a child for every child in your family or um, every grandchild who's been completely messed up by your children. You could fix that by sponsoring your grandkids a child. <laughs> And so uh, grab one of these child sponsorship packets and then fill it out before you leave and turn it into us so you can become that child sponsor. I want to say one last word to a lot of the folks who are here in this room. Leviticus, another law giving to Jews in the wilderness, says that you're not to rebuke your elders. And so I'm not. I'm going to very kindly and firmly encourage you. My father is 74 years old. And when he retired, he really struggled with why am I here? Nobody seems, he doesn't feel useful. And I just want to say to those of you who are of that age, you never get to retire from the kingdom. You are needed. We need you. And God can use you. He has gifted you through the decades with wisdom and knowledge and expertise that we just don't have. So please don't think that you're ever too young are too old to respond to today's message. Until you are dead, you are useful. You are valuable. You are loved. And God wants to love through you. Let me pray for us and we'll dismiss. God, I thank you so much for this opportunity to be with my brothers and sisters here in Canada. I just thank you so much for them. I, I thank you for this church that is generous to folks around the world and in this community. I just ask you to continue to bless them. God, I'm sorry for going a little long. I'm afraid the Methodists are going to beat us to all the good restaurants. But, God, I ask that you would, uh, that you would still, even though we're a little late, that you would still uh, move people to stick around for just a couple of minutes more and to sponsor children. And, God, more than that, I'm not here to speak for compassion. I'm here to speak for you, God. I ask that you would just speak to each of us whatever you want us to hear, that you would move us to whatever action you want us to take or whatever belief we need to change. God, we ask you to transform us. Please don't let these be words that go in our ears and then right back out. But God, drive these words into our hearts and change our lives with them. We love you, God. We thank you for all that you've given us, all the delicious what is it's in our life. God, we open our hands and we give them to you. Use us however you'd like. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. God bless you guys. It is our desire to encourage you through this program. If you do not yet belong to a church, we'd love to have you come and connect with us. We have programs for all ages. There is a spiritual need, or if you have been blessed through our service, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us during regular office hours by phone, or you can email us. Thank you for watching our service. May God bless you.